um very good morning all of you uh i'm glad that this uh, sunday morning i have you all with me today uh we are going to be talking a lot today we are going to be talking about one of the most ignored aspects of uh, endodontics and i say one of the when we are in dental school we are always told we are told that achieving prof profound anesthesia is important but then there's always this little bit of a doubt as to how important really your obturations are uh, there have been several number of articles where uh, they have told us that teeth which have not been obturated which are without an obturation can also survive for a very 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 long time and then i come in front of you today and i talk to you about three dimensional obturations well is it really that important let's really delve into this and see what exactly we are talking about uh, i am dr harsh harin shah i am a practicing endodontist from mumbai uh, i have been practicing for about 8 uh, years now and uh, teaching is my passion i will be putting up my uh, telephone number email address uh, at the end of the presentation in case there's ever any difficulty please feel free to get in touch with me let's talk about obturations so we all see that there are beautiful obturations that people post on facebook well by the way all the cases that i show in this presentation are going to be my own cases they are not from any other social media or from any other friends if i'm using any slide from a friend it will uh, mention courtesy to dr so and so so whatever obturations we uh, do these days or whatever obturations we are seeing online these days uh, a lot of them start giving us complexes what we really need to understand is these obturations are only white lines that we are seeing we are not seeing the kind of cleaning and shaping that the particular doctor has done or uh, the kind of effort that has gone into the case so sometimes it's very easy for us to just pass a comment uh, when we see an obturation which is not that well done we straight away assume that the doctor has not done a good job what we fail to realize here is the doctor probably put in the best effort that he could and still he could not achieve ideal results and this can happen with the best of us how much ever hard we are struggling to do our cases there is always going to be a time when we don't achieve the results that we desire so uh, when you talk about complex anatomy uh, i'll just give you a small guideline here yeah so what i'm talking about is uh, very often we see teeth which have these kind of j hooks in the apical third especially mandibular molars distal root uh, this is almost quite common maybe not up to this degree but uh, having apical curvatures in mandibular molars is obviously very common then there are these young permanent molars if you can make out this is a very young girl here um this is this is a stainless steel crown that give, we've given on top wide canals short roots so these are the kind of cases that we are talking about we always keep feeling that the particular doctor may or may not have done a good job and then there is also this question these particular white bands or white blobs that you see around are these really necessary do these indicate success of treatment or they don't just giving you some samples of obturations this is a, a mandibular first molar with extremely long roots these were about 27 mm in the distal canal and uh, our aim always remains the same we want to reach up to the apical terminus and we want to have a good three dimensional seal these are mandibular uh, first and second molars uh, you can easily make out that there are two canals in the mandibular first molar there is also a lateral exit here so what i am going to be talking about with uh, to you today is how to fill these areas see filling the main root canals is extremely easy filling the entire root canal system is what is complicating if you pay a little bit of attention onto this molar you will be able to make out there is a tiny lateral canal here somewhere in the middle third of the mesial root there is also some apical delta multiple portals of exit in this mandibular first premolar so these are the kind of obturations that we are talking about we are not talking of regular obturations obviously i'm going to be taking you through a lot of questions that we'll be dealing like why do we need to obturate how do we obturate when do we obturate let us see some uh, questions like that this is another uh, mandibular first molar that you see here huge distal cavity uh, we start with the working length we uh, discover three canals in the mesial root and uh, one in the distal root this is the master cone radiograph that you can see and this is the final obturation i don't want you to uh, appreciate the fact that there are three canals in the mesial root the reason i have put this radiograph is because of this anatomy here similarly you can see there is a pical delta in the mesial root as well 
this is an angulated radiograph of the same tooth again and you can uh, clearly appreciate the filling of the apical delta now like i told you we'll be coming to a lot of questions so let's take the first question why do we need to obturate there have been several studies which say that they have tried keeping teeth only after cleaning and shaping and they have put a permanent restoration without obturation some of these will also tell you that this particular treatment modality has been successful for them but most of them say that this does not last so the primary reason that we obturate teeth is because we want to have a airtight fluid tight seal in the apical end as well as at the orifice of the canal we want the root canal system to be totally obliterated why because whenever you are doing your cleaning and shaping you can never be 100% sure that you have cleaned everything out there are going to be some bacteria some bacterial by products some toxins which are still left inside the canal now you don't want these bacteria and bacterial by products to come in contact with the rest of the anatomy you want them to be isolated and sealed for this seal you require to obturate another reason for obturation is when you leave your root canals completely empty without any obturation it is a hollow space right in the middle of the tooth so when there are forces on the tooth there are higher chances of fracture there are quite some studies which have shown this that once gutta percha is used for obturation the strength of the tooth increases these are basically the reasons why we obturate see this is another uh, mandibular first molar with three mesial canals here and one or two distal canals which are right now not seen in this particular image this is the final obturation radiograph of the same patient you can clearly appreciate three canals in the mesial uh, probably two canals in the distal so the next question is till, till where should i obturate because you know we've all been told that um, your obturation should be uh, right up to the working length right up to the working length some people will say it should be kept 1 mm short of the working length some will say 2 mm short of the working length so let's see exactly till where we need to work if you can understand this diagram clearly i'll just show you what i'm talking about now obviously this is the dentine this is the cementum and this is the pdl right clear so far yeah now um, let's let's talk about this this is the periodontal ligament and whatever is present inside the tooth was the pulp right so where is the junction between the pulp and the periodontal ligament the junction is the cemento dentinal junction that is this particular point here and this particular point here so what i'm saying is all the tissue that is present till this extent must be cleaned out whatever is present beyond this should be left the way it is why do i say this because the aim of your endodontic treatment is to extirpate pulp not the periodontal ligament so what i mean by this is and now there is one tiny problem with this as well the peri, uh, the cdj or the cemento dentinal junction is not a clinical entity it is a histological entity you cannot see the cemento dentinal junction so because this is a histological entity we try to clinically correlate it with some clinical facts like what this cemento dentinal junction generally coincides with the minor diameter of the tooth now what do i mean by the minor diameter or the apical constriction which is alter which it is alternatively called as the apical constriction or the minor diameter is the narrowest portion of the root canal in the apical third so obviously if you see this diagram you can make out that the narrowest portion is going to be in this region correct so which is precisely what i am talking about this is where your cleaning shaping and obturation should end then why do we say it should be half to 1 mm short of the radiographic apex because on your radiographs the cementum also appears to be a part of the root so your radiograph is going to be till here and your obturation will be till here most studies have shown that this distance is approximately 0.5 to 1 mm which is why we keep our obturation half to 1 mm short of the radiographic length now let's relate this to the apex locator because radiographs is not all that we want now when you are using an apex locator like this this is an i root by exam, uh, by the way so when you are using an apex locator like this you start putting your file down and the apex locator keeps giving you particular readings right you are supposed to stop not at 0.5 but only and only when you reach 0.0 0.0 is the point where you want to take your apex locator reading up there why 
because this 0.5 does not really mean half millimeter short of the apex you can go and check your own apex locators no apex locators will give you readings in millimeters you see they don't write 2 millimeters 1.5 millimeters 1 millimeter they will only write 1.5 1 0 0.50 Make sure to take your file right up till zero and only then estimate your working length. So where should my working length be till? See, what you should basically be doing is you take your file up till zero, adjust the stopper, take the file out. Once you've taken the file out, you'll measure it on a ruler. Whatever reading the ruler gives you, you will reduce half a millimeter from that and you will assume that to be your working length. Let's move ahead now. Yeah. So there is this one tiny question I want to ask you all. Uh, will you be obturating a tooth which has a draining sinus? Because my next question is going to be when do we obturate teeth? So one question I'm asking you before going to when do we obturate teeth is will you obturate a tooth which has a draining sinus? Uh, Dr. Roxon will be putting up a poll for you. I'll wait for a couple of minutes for some answers to come in and uh, then we will continue with the presentation ahead of this. Can you obturate a tooth which has a draining sinus? So I have some readings in front of me. Um, we are almost at 50-50, 55, 45. Come on, come on guys, we need more numbers here. I need a definite answer, right? A patient comes to you, he has an abscess on the side in the vestibule somewhere, which is uh, you assume that it is associated with a particular root. You do sinus tracing there by putting a gutta percha point. Then how do you decide whether I'm going to do a single visit root canal for this patient or do I need to give a dressing? I have more than 130 people here and the answers I have right now are in the range of 53, 47. So, um, 54, 52, 51. Okay, so I assume that um, we are biased about this. We don't have any particular sure short answer to this. Now, let me just explain this particular scenario to you. What happens is when you have a... Okay, so finally we have stopped at 50-50. So uh, that's exactly half of the people who feel that we should be doing an obturation for a tooth which has a draining sinus and half of y'all who feel that we should not be obturating this tooth for now. Uh, now, when we talk about uh, obturation of a tooth which has a draining sinus, uh, what I want to tell you here is whenever a tooth has a draining sinus, please realize that this particular tooth is also going to have some place where all the infectious can drain out from the root canal. Because of this, it is 100% safe to obturate this tooth on the first day itself. That is, you can easily perform a single visit endodontic treatment. You do not need to give a dressing. So let's see, let's look at cases that can be obturated and cases that you should not be obturated, right? Now, some of these are only textual answers and they don't hold true in today's scenario, but I'm also going to tell you what is practical as of now. Teeth which are asymptomatic can be obturated. So patient is not complaining to you about any swelling, uh, not complaining to you about any uh, pain. So you are safe to obturate these teeth. If you can get a dry canal, if you can clean out all the exudate from the canal and the canal is completely dry when you insert a paper point inside, you can safely obturate the root. If there is any foul odor that is emanating from the root canals or from the pulp chamber, it indicates sign of active anaerobic infection, which is why you should postpone your obturation and you should not do the obturation on the same day. The temporary restoration that you had put in the last appointment should be intact. Because if the temporary restoration is dislodged, what happens is uh, the saliva from the patient's mouth, it enters the root canal, it enters the pulp chamber and there are, there are chances of infection again. And you should have a negative culture from the root canal. What this means is uh, historically what people used to do was uh, they would take a paper point after completely, uh, after finishing their cleaning, shaping, drying of the canals, they would take a paper point, put it inside the canal. They would send these paper points to a laboratory and they used to culture the paper point. So in case there is bacterial growth, they would not obturate, they would give dressings. But uh, this is a very time consuming process. So some uh, in clinic uh, culture systems were also introduced, but uh, by far they have not picked up popularity. So 
from my experience and what i have read i would like to tell you that if you have a canal which is dry and there is no foul odor please feel free to obturate it is okay if the patient has slight amount of pain it is okay if the temporary restoration is dislodged but if you have a canal which is not moist at all and if there is no foul odor you can safely obturate this canal one third condition where i would say you cannot do a single visit endo or you should not do a single visit endo is uh, cases of reroot canals because in retreatments the kind of uh, bacterial flora in the tooth is very different and your routine irrigants cannot take care of these bacteria so you need to um, give a dressing of chlorhexidine so that all the bacteria are taken care of but this is a completely different topic i'm not discussing that right now what i want to tell you is the only three cases when you will not obturate on the same day is if you are doing a reroot canal if you cannot have dry canals that is the canals are weeping or moist and if you have foul odor coming out of the canal sometimes you know when you remove the temporary restoration the patient tells you doctor i can feel something stinking inside the mouth or sometimes even you can sense it these cases please don't obturate on that day okay so uh, let's move on to the next topic let's assume you've done your cleaning and shaping uh, thoroughly you've completed the entire irrigation cycle and now you are good to obturate what are you going to do you will take a master cone radiograph you will take your gp points put them inside the canal and you will expose a radiograph there are some things that i want to tell you about these radiographs as well sometimes what happens is when you have put these gp points inside they might go slightly outside your root canals radiographically correct so let's discuss what what to do if they go beyond what to do if they are short so in case your uh, master cone is extremely loose inside the canal there are two things you can do either you cut 1 mm from the tip or you start putting accessory cones these are the only two things you can do another scenario is if the uh, gp point is short of the working length it does not go to the prepared working length you should select a smaller cone if the smaller cone also does not go to the full working length you need to refine your root canal shaping so you use your master pickle file one more time and you make sure that your uh, master uh, cone goes to the complete working length and sometimes like in this case you can see the master cone goes slightly beyond the working length in such cases uh, the situation is very simple you can either cut this point a little bit and then repeat your radiograph or take a cone which is larger in size and can go up to the adequate working length what you need to be sure is about the tuck back that you feel so let's talk about what exactly this tuck back is see what happens is when you're preparing your canals sometimes you feel that you are going up to the full working length but the gp point is not stiff inside the canal you don't feel resistance from the walls of the root canal and if you do not feel resistance from the root canal walls it means that the gp point is very loose inside the root canal whenever a gutta percha point is loose inside a canal it is not the right uh, decision to obturate as it is because what happens is in case let's take just this gp point for example now here if you can see in the apical third the gp point is snugly fitting inside the root canal if this was not the case what would happen is when i start obturating and i apply a little bit of pressure on the master point my gp point will get pushed beyond the root canal so it's very important whenever you are taking the master point radiograph you should literally push your gp points as much as you can during the radiograph itself i see a lot of people being worried about uh, if i push my gp point it will go beyond in my radiograph it's okay if it goes beyond in this master cone radiograph because you can still adjust it if it goes beyond after your obturation it becomes extremely difficult to retrieve the gutta percha back another couple of points about tuck back i want to make is sometimes what happens is uh, especially when you are preparing your canals up till 6% you get false tuck back from the coronal or the middle third of the root canal however the apical third does not give you tuck back the only way to be sure that you have tuck back from the apical third is if you are you have prepared this particular canal with a 6% uh, rotary file you make sure to obturate it uh, with a 4% gutta percha which means there will be dead space in the middle and the coronal thirds but the apical third the gp will be snugly fitting and you will have adequate tuck back this dead space in the middle and the coronal third may be filled with any other techniques like lateral condensation or 
uh, continuous wave condensation, your thermoplastic obturation techniques. That is not our concern. Our primary concern is the tug back from the apical third of the canal. So after we've spoken about the master cone radiograph, obviously the next thing that we need to talk about are the kind of sealers that we are using. Now, whichever type of sealer you use, the first point to note here is your sealer has to be used in minimum quantity. I see people mixing a lot of sealer, coating the entire gutta percha point with sealer. Uh, even if you put up, uh, pick up the GP, there is a sealer that is dripping down. This is not the right way to use your sealer. Your root canal anatomy has to primarily be occupied by the gutta percha points and only the spaces between the GPs should be filled by the sealers. Now, when we talk about sealers, uh, there are various different types of sealers that are available to us, like you all know. The first and the most common one that we use is zinc oxide eugenol based sealers. Now, the important thing to note here is that zinc oxide eugenol based sealers are completely different from the zinc oxide eugenol cement that you use. Those big bottles that you get, you mix them for your temporary restorations or for some other things. These sealers are zinc oxide eugenol based. They are not zinc oxide eugenol cement. They have some additional properties. The solubility of these sealers is quite low compared to the ZOE cement. So please make sure if you're using a ZOE based sealer, purchase a separate sealer and don't use your zinc oxide eugenol for obturation. Uh, the most popular ones in this category are uh, pulp canal sealer, EWD, uh, which is from uh, Cybron Endo, that is Kerr. Then uh, you have Tubely Seal, which is a tube based zinc oxide eugenol based sealer, which is also from the same company. Uh, another favorite is Endomethazone, which is from Septodont, uh, which is also a ZOE based sealer. Uh, Endomethazone also has a few extra uh, ingredients. Primarily to note is the steroid component that, is that it has. The earlier versions of Endomethazone also had paraformaldehyde, but obviously now because paraformaldehyde is not allowed anymore. Uh, they have completely removed paraformaldehyde from the composition and they only use steroids. So um, a few things about ZOE based sealers is uh, these sealers are, trust me, they are the gold standard of sealers. They are seriously the best quality of sealers that you can get. The reason being that the film thickness is extremely less. You can get the perfect consistency when you mix it and you raise that spatula from your mixing pad or the glass slab. You can see a one inch string of the sealer. Uh, which is why I love uh, ZOE based sealers. But these ZOE based sealers cannot be used in every scenario. Why? Because there is eugenol. <coughs> As we know, eugenol interferes with bonding. So if you are planning to give a fiber post in a particular canal, you cannot use a zinc oxide eugenol based sealer. Because these fiber posts need to be bonded with resin cements. Resin cements are nothing but uh, modified composites. Composites cannot bond to a eugenol treated dentine. The bonding is very weak. So we don't use ZOE based sealers if you are going to put a fiber post. Another important thing to note is whenever you have a ZOE based, uh, whenever you are using a ZOE based sealer, make sure to clean the entire pulp chamber thoroughly. Any remnants of eugenol in the pulp chamber will interfere with the polymerization of your composite restoration that you do after the obturation. So that's all about uh, zinc oxide eugenol based sealers. Uh, next, I want to talk to you about calcium hydroxide based sealers. Now, when we talk about calcium hydroxide based sealers, there's been a lot of talk about these sealers because uh, seal apex from uh, Cybron Endo especially had gotten extremely popular. But a lot of people had their reservations because this contains calcium hydroxide. It uh, has more dissolution. It will uh, show more solubility and then the canal will not have any sealer at all. So I'll just like to clear a little bit of air. Now these calcium hydroxide based sealers are actually present in a resin matrix. They are suspended in a resin matrix because of which the solubility is not as high as some people think it is. Another important thing is uh, these sealers, because they contain calcium hydroxide, they have a continuous release of calcium ions because of which some studies have shown that the chances of infection are reduced. So the uh, two most common calcium hydroxide based sealers are Apexit Plus and uh, which is from Ivoclar Vivad and then Seal Apex which is from Cybron uh, Endo. The third kind of sealer that I want to talk to you about are the resin based sealers. Now resin based sealers have got uh, their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, these are the perfect sealers for me whenever I want to put a fiber post into the tube. 
because it's a resin it's not going to interfere with the uh, bonding or polymerization of my resin cement the popular um, sealers in the resin based category are obviously AH plus which is from uh, Densply then there is Sealmax R which is from uh, Mark products so these uh, sealers they have they are extremely good in quality they have all the properties that you like but somehow there is a lot of reservation about uh, using resin based sealers because the first point is resin based sealers are extremely difficult to retrieve from the root canal for a resin based sealer you need in case you have to do a retreatment for a tooth in which you had done an obturation using say AH plus for example you may need to use a different kind of gutta percha solvent altogether why because your regular gp solvent cannot dissolve resins it can only dissolve the gutta percha so you like need to use a different kind of solvent uh, so that you can also soften the resin sealer that you are using another disadvantage is that these resin based sealers um, probably because of the humidity and uh, heat in our uh, climate the indian climate what happens is uh, they seem to be of a very runny consistency when you mix them and then in after uh, a few moments it immediately sets into something which is very thick so what happens is to know when exactly to pick up the sealer and put it in the canal it becomes kind of a challenge so uh, because of these and the third important reason why people are not using uh, resin based sealers is the cost uh, because uh, these sealers are a little expensive compared to the other sealers and uh, the consistency is not ideal when you uh, use it in our scenario now uh, after the resin based sealers what has been picking up the most is bioceramic sealers uh, why do i talk about bioceramic sealers what is so special about them now these bioceramic sealers are basically of three types uh, there are sealers which are based on calcium phosphate there are sealers which are based on calcium silicate and then there are mta based sealers uh, what exactly do i mean by a bioceramic sealer see bioceramic sealers are uh, sealers which have uh, these calcium phosphate or calcium silicate or trisilicate particles and they are extremely biocompatible how this helps basically is if a sealer is so biocompatible it does not matter if it gets extruded outside the root canal plus a lot of these uh, sealers have uh, osseo conductive and osseo inductive properties so what they do is once they are at the apex they ask the pdl to bring about healing so the pdl and the bone around the tooth the healing properties of these bioceramic sealers are extremely good examples of bioceramic sealers are uh, mda uh, philopex uh, then you have ceraseal b you have uh, ceraseal rc uh, you have sealers like see you can see uh, ceraseal rc or you have uh, endo sequence bc so there are so many different kinds of bioceramic sealers you also have something called as uh, gutta flow bioseal which is a combination which is basically a bioceramic sealer but they have also incorporated gutta percha particles into the sealer itself so it becomes a mono block when you obturate the canal anyways uh, moving on talking about bioceramic sealers uh, these sealers are my favorite for all kinds of complex cases what i mean by complex cases is whenever i see a large periapical lesion i will always obturate using a bioceramic sealer uh, another indication for these bioceramic sealers for me is whenever there is a perforation anywhere in the root i will always use a bioceramic sealer with my gutta percha point because uh, the perforation repair which i am carrying out with mta my bioceramic sealer and mta go very well hand in hand and they are good friends so basically there is not going to be any interface between them any leakage between the mta and the bioceramic sealer so if you feel surprised to see this slide what is disinfection of gutta percha point see the reason i am putting this here is what happens in your practice is when you have a particular patient you are doing you take a master cone radiograph after the master cone radiograph uh, what happens is you are busy seeing the radiograph the gutta percha is in the patient's mouth or even when you are taking the radiograph the uh, gp is basically swimming in a pool of saliva sometimes you remove the gutta percha point from the tooth and you drop it down and very often what you do is you pick up that gp point and you use it for obturation this is not the right thing to do because what happens is you have made the canal you have cleaned and shaped the canal as effectively as you could the canal is close to sterile in this sterile environment if we introduce any external bacteria they they are going to multiply very fast this is one of the reasons why after obturation the patient uh, even though the obturation looks 
perfect on your radiographs, the patient still complains of pain. Now, uh, another scenario is you use a tweezer, right, to take the gutta percha points out of the box. Now that box, when it came to you, it was packed. It was sterile. The moment you opened it, it has turned non-sterile. Plus, you are using a tweezer which was used for handling the patient's cotton rolls and God knows what all. And then the same tweezer goes inside the box of gutta percha points. How do you expect these GP points to still remain sterile? So it's important that after the master cone radiograph is taken, you should disinfect the gutta percha points. So the next question is, how do you disinfect these GP points? The way you do that is, you dip your GP points into a dappen dish which is filled with sodium hypochlorite. You will keep the gutta percha points in this sodium hypochlorite for approximately one minute. What happens is after you've removed the GP after one minute, once the hypo dries off from the gutta percha points, there are some salt deposits on the GP points, which you need to rinse. How do you rinse it? You just clean your GP points with alcohol or spirit. If you find this procedure very complicated, there is another simpler way to do it. You use 2% chlorhexidine. Just use it for a couple of minutes. Uh, you can take a gauze piece, which is uh, basically flooded with chlorhexidine. You put all your three or four GP points in this gauze piece. Close the gauze piece. Leave it as it is for two minutes. Remove and straight away obturate. You don't need to rinse this GP point. So these are two simple and effective ways of uh, disinfection of your uh, gutta percha points before you actually obturate the teeth. Which brings me to the next point that is the obturation materials and techniques. See, there's not much to talk about the materials because I don't want to go into the theoretical and histori uh, historical interest points such as uh, paste obturations or uh, silver points and stuff. So what we'll be talking about in obturations basically is the kind of techniques that you can use for obturation. Um, I'll tell you one or two sentences about each of these techniques so you have a rough idea and then we will explain in detail only those techniques which are still popularly used. So talking of obturation techniques, the first obturation technique I want to talk about is lateral condensation or uh, collateral compaction, which is basically uh, lateral pushing of the gutta percha with the use of a spreader. I'm sure all of y'all have performed this particular obturation technique at some point or the other. What you do is you take one master gutta percha, you put a spreader inside to create space for accessory gutta perchas, and then you keep inserting accessory GP points. The next technique is the vertical compaction technique, uh, which is also called as warm vertical compaction. What you do here is your the gutta percha that you've put inside, you will take a heat source, heat this gutta percha, and you will start pushing it vertically. It's very important that you have good apical tuck back in these cases to make sure that the gutta percha does not get pushed beyond the gutta. I will be discussing this in more detail, obviously. Continuous wave condensation is only a modification of the warm vertical compaction. We'll see a video for the continuous wave condensation technique also. Then there is warm lateral compaction. It is same as lateral uh, condensation. The only difference is the spreader that you introduce inside the canal is heated before it is put into the canal. Because of this heat, the gutta percha inside, which is thermoplastic, it melts slightly and it starts flowing. Uh, the next obturation technique is uh, the injection technique in which either hot or cold gutta percha are directly injected through a syringe. We will see both of these techniques in detail. Thermomechanical compaction or if you remember there was something called as a Max Padden compactor. What this basically did was um, you have a file which um, uh, when it rotates inside the canal at a fast speed, because of the friction it dissolves the GP. This gutta percha after dissolving will obviously flow. We use this property of the gutta percha for bringing out three dimensional obturation. And then there are core carrier based uh, obturation systems. I'll show you pictures to make it more clear what uh, carrier based obturation systems are. There are chemoplasticized obturation systems where you dip your gutta percha into a gutta percha solvent for a few seconds. You take it out. So this gutta percha point is soft. Then you can introduce this inside the canal because it is soft it flows into the lateral anatomy very effectively. Then there are apical barrier techniques in which you only obturate the apical third of the root canal. Most common material for the apical barrier technique is uh, MTA or mineral trioxide aggregate. We'll see that as well. Now out of all of these techniques, the techniques which are used commonly are only these and that is why we are only going to discuss these in detail. Let's see cold lateral compaction. 
Uh, when I talk of collateral compaction, the the technique is extremely simple. You use a master gutta percha point. You take a spreader. You try to insert the spreader as deep as possible, preferably within one millimeter of the working length. The moment you remove the spreader out, you will be putting some accessory gutta percha inside. Then you take an instrument which is a heat source and you seal it at the orifice. That's how simple collateral compaction can be. However, there are several disadvantages with this technique. One disadvantage is because of the massive force that you need to put onto the spreader, there are chances that the tooth gets vertically fractured. Another disadvantage is, see what you're trying to, uh, what you're doing actually in lateral compaction is you're filling your canals like this. But there are still dead spaces between these GP points. Ideally, your uh, root canal obturation after lateral compaction should have been something like this. But that does not happen. Let us see this in a dental scenario. Uh, this tooth has been obturated using uh, lateral condensation technique. The obturation looks fairly good. It looks fairly dense in the apical third, middle third, coronal third, everywhere. But when you take an angulated radiograph, when you turn this tooth completely sideways and you take a mesodistal radiograph for this tooth, you can see the kind of dead space present inside this root canal. This happens especially when a tooth has an ovoid or conical cross section. It will not happen very frequently in round canals, but it's very common in oval canals, which is why lateral condensation is becoming less and less of a favorite. Because in lateral condensation, always you will leave out some amount of the tooth structure not obturated. So they came up with thermoplastic or 3D obturation techniques. Now, when you talk of uh, Three dimensional obturation techniques there are some things that you require uh, warm lateral sorry lateral condensation can probably not give you a three dimensional fill so what exactly do you need for a 3d obturation you need to perform extremely good irrigation you need to activate your irrigants and you need to have a fantastic preparation of the root canal system how are we going to achieve this let's see that Let's talk a little bit about the irrigation protocol and the irrigants that are to be used. What happens is this is the kind of anatomy that you see in your root canals. With this anatomy, what happens is because there is so many anastomoses, there are isthmi, uh, there are apical deltas. Like in this particular maxillary molar, it's difficult to even count the number of root canals. There may be somewhere close to six canals probably, but you can never be sure because there is so much of uh, interaction between different root canals, filling all of these with just gutta percha or filling them with just uh, lateral condensation is close to impossible, which is why we rely on our irrigants. Your irrigants can enter these spaces. They can dissolve the pulp tissue in these spaces. Once the pulp tissue is dissolved, it is easier for your thermoplastic gutta percha to flow in these, uh, flow in these intricacies. So what irrigants do you really use when you are performing um, endodontics? There are only four irrigants that you need. You need 5% of sodium hypochlorite throughout your instrumentation. You need 17% aqueous EDTA, that is the EDTA solution that you get. Uh, this is, mind you, this is different from the EDTA that you uh, use along with your files, the RC help, RC prep, glide. Uh, these formulations are EDTA with carbamide peroxide or EDTA with urea peroxide. What I am talking about is an aqueous solution of EDTA right now. Uh, this needs to be activated for one minute. You also use chlorhexidine in some cases. Uh, chlorhexidine uh, is to be used in cases where you have a lot of uh, infection in the periapical area or whenever you are doing a re-endodontic treatment. And you use uh, saline or sterile water between two irrigants so that these irrigants don't come in contact with each other, so that they don't interact with each other. Now, when I talk about activation of irrigants, the kind of activation that is most accepted as of date is ultrasonic activation. Whenever you're performing ultrasonic activation or ultrasonic agitation of your uh, irrigants, there are two phenomena that occur inside the root canal, cavitation and acoustic streaming. I'm sure you're all aware about this because we were thoroughly taught uh, cavitation and acoustic streaming in periodontics. Now, the thing that I'm talking about, why is ultrasonic activation better is basically because if you are using a sonic activator, there are studies that have shown that if you don't use ultrasonic, there is no cavitation inside the canal. And if there is no cavitation, 
the particular activation technique that you use has no antimicrobial efficacy whatsoever because of which it is amply said now that you need to use an activator which has ultrasonic properties because sonic alone is not sufficient uh, it's very clear in this obturation picture if you can see uh, whenever you perform regular irrigation a lot of the root canal area is left as dead space or it is filled with dentinal debris however if you activate the irrigants using your ultrasonic activator you get perfect three dimensional fill of the root canal so here in the prerequisites we can easily see that it is extremely important to activate the irrigants with an ultrasonic activator so let's discuss what can irrigation protocol you need to follow whenever you are performing endodontics this is not restricted to a, to a particular type of obturation technique or a particular type of case this is a universal irrigation protocol which i have been following and it has been working well for me throughout your instrumentation you will only use 5% sodium hypochlorite for irrigation there should be no saline no sterile water on your tray only sodium hypochlorite once you have taken your master cone radiograph and you are ready to obturate you will rinse the canal with sterile water or saline and you will use 17% edta this edta needs to be ultrasonically activated for 1 minute once this is done you again rinse it off with sterile water or saline one more time you will use the same 5% sodium hypochlorite but this time you will activate it for 30 seconds these both steps activation of edta and activation of sodium hypochlorite are extremely important for three dimensional fills after you have uh, activated the sodium hypochlorite you will just flush with sterile water or saline you have an alternate step of uh, irrigating with chlorhexidine at the end which can be left in the canal for 2 minutes and then you can straight away proceed for obturation all or in teeth which are heavily infected you will use the same chlorhexidine as an intracanal medicament and you will leave it inside the canal so to gain good results to gain a three dimensional fill like here you can see we have filled a lateral canal in this case you can see we have filled an apical delta or a lateral canal there is sealer in the pdl space as well to get these kind of obturations following this irrigation protocol is extremely important now that we've discussed about the irrigants let's talk about the steps to follow during a root canal to have good three dimensional obturation just in short you need to have a straight line access you have to locate your canals using a 10 number k file when i talk locate canals i mean only locate the canals only put your files in the canal till about 12 to 13 mm you till wherever it goes very easily you don't need to go till the apex at all once you have located the canals you will use your orifice shaper uh, files your orifice wideners um you may be using one flare you may be using endo flare you may be using sx whatever you are using you use that orifice shaper for enlarging the coronal third what happens because of this is there is more space available for accommodating a higher volume of the irrigant that you are using more the irrigant better the tissue resolution inside the canal after using the orifice shaper you will use the same 10 number k files but this time you will go right up till the apex and you will determine the working length extremely important to note it is that working length is always determined after the coronal flaring is complete please keep this in mind after you have established the working length you will prepare a glide path either using manual files or rotary files and only then do you move to your rotary instruments once rotary instrumentation is done you can go to your same steps of cone fit radiograph tuck back uh, application of sealer and finally obturation so whenever you are performing three dimensional obturation it becomes extremely important to have a good set of hand pluggers now these hand pluggers if you take a good set of hand pluggers they will have one end which will be made out of nickel titanium which will help the plugger to go inside deep even in curved canals and the other end will be made out of stainless steel because these stainless steel tips have more stiffness and you can use it for packing the middle and the coronal third whereas the nickel titanium end can be used in the apical third that's why the nickel titanium end is always given slightly smaller than the stainless steel end now let's talk about the different techniques of uh, three dimensional obturation 
Now, the first method that I want to talk about is the core carrier based obturation. What happens in the core carrier based obturation is these are what you see here in these three pictures. These are gutta percha points. These gutta percha points are uh, they come with handle and there is a core in between which is also called as the carrier. This is pre-marked at 18, 19, uh, 20, 22, 24. The reason uh, there is a core carrier in between is because this gutta percha that is present on the surface can be softened by heating it and then you can put this carrier inside the carrier may either be made of metal or plastic once you have carried it inside the canal you just need to cut the carrier at the orifice once you have cut the carrier at the orifice the seal inside the canal will be extremely good what you need to note here is the thickness of this carrier is always going to be greater than the number that is mentioned on the carrier or greater than the master apical file that you have used. That's why they always come with a set of verifiers. So if I have prepared my canal till 30 number file, I can take a 30 sized verifier to see if a 30 numbered core carrier will easily go inside the root canal or not. Right? Because once this GP point is uh, becomes thermoplastic, the carrier can enter the canal more easily. How do you heat these carriers? Now? There are different kinds of ovens which are available. Uh, the systems are called Therma Prep, uh, Therma Fill, Simply Fill, Gutta Core, etc. Uh, what these ovens basically do is see this is a core carrier that has been kept. I just need to press on to this button. Once I press on this button, uh, the core carrier goes inside the oven. In the oven, there is controlled heating of the Gutta Percha on the core carrier. What I do then is I, this is my verifier inside the canal. It fits snugly inside the canal. This is my core carrier which has been heated. I start pushing it inside. I will adjust my stopper to my working lens so I know when to stop. Once I am sure that my stopper has reached the coronal reference point, I will stop inserting this inside the canal. Which means I would have reached the apex of the root canal. Then I will just take a heated instrument if I am using a plastic carrier. Or I will have to use a rotary instrument like a burr if I have a metal carrier inside and I will seal it off. These days all carriers that are available are, are either made of plastic or they are made of gutta percha itself. Uh, stiff gutta percha. So that's how you seal it and this gives you fantastic three dimensional filling. The problem with this technique is sometimes what happens is you may not get, uh, you may waste gutta percha points because when you are when you have heated it and when you insert it inside the canal the carrier may be stripped of the gutta percha and only carrier may be left so you realize that there is a lot of dead space in the obturation this especially happens when you are starting your uh, when you know you are new with this particular technique so and you cannot basically afford to waste these gp points because they are expensive so they also turn out to be a higher cost for you whenever you have a particular molar which has four or five canals the cost of obturation greatly increases Plus, you need to invest in the oven. Another disadvantage is, uh, or I'll say rather another precaution that you need to take is, when you are inserting the core carrier inside the canal, don't ever twist or rotate it. Just slowly, you need to straight push it up till the apex. If you rotate or twist it, same thing will happen. The gutta percha will be stripped from the surface and there will be a lot of dead space in your obturation. So uh, after this, after the core carrier based obturation, I want to talk to you about a very simple means of obturating that is the cold flowable obturation. Uh, what exactly this means is we don't have many products available. The most popular one obviously is uh, Gutta Flow 2 which is from Cold Team. Um, now this Gutta Flow 2 is basically a sealer in which they have also incorporated Gutta Percha, gutta percha particles. What you need to do is you inject this sealer inside the root canal which which is why we call it a flowable obturation system and then you just take one master cone insert in the canal till the full working length and seal it because the sealer also has gutta percha particles and your gp point also has gutta percha particles it becomes kind of a monoblock there is good adaptation Plus, because this is flowable, it can flow into all the accessory anatomy and it can bring about good quality of obturation. Uh, 
the disadvantage is if i were to enumerate for uh, gutta flow 2 or for a cold flowable system is um, you tend to waste a lot of this sealer because it's an automix type of syringe uh, the amount of wastage is higher uh, another uh, disadvantage is that this sets extremely fast so you need to be really quick when you're putting it inside the canal you can't afford to waste time now after we discuss the cold flowable obturation let's discuss hot flowable obturation what i basically mean by hot flowable obturation a lot of uh, doctors also call it as squirt obturation or squirting obturation uh, these kind of guns are available which are called as backfill guns or backpack guns uh, you put a gutta percha pellet here and the gutta percha pellet is heated inside the gun the moment you start injecting hot gutta percha comes out and you can fill the canal with that we'll have a short video when we uh, discuss the continuous wave condensation so this will become much more clearer the primary disadvantage of squirting obturation is that there is no apical control because you are only injecting gutta percha inside there is no control over the apical third then another technique called the warm vertical compaction very simple in the warm vertical compaction we used to do uh, what we used to do was we used to take a heat source and seal the gutta percha and heat the gutta percha to a deeper level we used to proceed step by step first the coronal third then the middle third then the apical third once the apical gutta percha is sheared, sheared off only the apical 4 5 mm of gp will be uh, left then you take a cold plugger and condense it now here you had to go step by step so it used to take a lot of time so we modified this technique and we came up with something called continuous wave compaction what do you do in continuous wave compaction is in a single stroke you go right up till the apical third and you seal the gp then you take a cold plugger and you condense the cut up also don't get confused the video will make it much much more clear this is the kind of uh, system that you will require for uh, continuous wave condensation this unit uh, is called an eqv which is from metabiomed like you can see eqv is a set of two devices the first device is called the down pack the down pack what it does is with this down pack you obturate the apical third of the canal with the back fill you obturate the middle and the coronal thirds of the canal how let's see in the video you will take gutta percha points uh which will match the master apical file that you as use you had used so with these master gutta percha points you will confirm the tuck back your gutta percha point should be half to 1 mm short of the apex you will take appropriately fitting hand pluggers these hand pluggers should be good quality and you need to preselect them and see that they reach the apical 5 or 6 mm similarly you will take a tip to attach to the down pack unit this tip also needs to correspond with the size of your gutta percha adjust the rubber stopper on the tip according to uh, the working length it should be 5 to 6 mm short of the working length mix sealer take a little bit of sealer on your gutta percha point <coughs> gently pump the gutta percha point inside and then insert the gp till the full depth once you have done this you use your uh, down pack unit put it on heat it to a temperature of 180 or 230 degrees celsius there is a button on the uh, down pack unit which you need to press once you press this button heating starts if you can see in the picture with the heat we've just removed the uh, excess gutta percha which is above the orifice once this excess gutta percha is removed we will start using the same tip and going deeper inside the canal once i have reached my stopper which was adjusted 5 to 6 mm short of the working length i will keep this tip inside for another 5 to 10 seconds after that i will just activate it for 1 to 2 seconds and i will pull the tip out the reason for these 1 to 2 seconds is so that the entire gutta percha from the apical third does not get pulled out the next instrument i used is my condenser that is my plugger i plug the apical third of the root canal and this is how my apical obturation is complete the next unit i use is my backfill unit this backfill unit is the gun that i had shown you there are gp pellets available which you insert inside the gun you start the heating of the gun by pressing the buttons there the gp starts going inside your needle once it has gone in this cartridge it starts getting heated a blinking light on the unit of the eqv shows that heating is going on once the light is stable bright it means that heating has been accomplished 
once heating is accomplished you will carry this gun inside the root canal you will keep it in contact with the apical gutta percha for 4 to 5 seconds because you want to soften the apical gutta percha so that all of this becomes a single unit then you start injecting by pressing the plunger on the gun you will fill 3 to 4 mm remove the gun outside you will take the same plugger that you had used and you will condense this soft gutta percha once this is done you repeat the same process take the gun again backfill a little bit more take the uh, next plugger and condense the gutta percha that's how simple obturations can be the primary advantage of using a system like this over something like a uh, thermafill or a core carrier based obturation is when you use a continuous wave condensation technique the cost of obturation reduces greatly because this gutta percha is not expensive plus this obturation is much much quicker although in the video it looked like it took a very long time you will not take more than 15 or 20 seconds per root canal uh, as of date the Universally most accepted uh, technique for obturation is continuous wave condensation. It is not any other technique right now. So please make sure to invest in these kind of units so that you can perform three dimensional obturations adequately. So, okay, I don't want to invest in this unit, but I still want to perform three dimensional obturations. What option do I have? So there was something called as thermomechanical obturation that we discussed a little while back where I told you that you use something like a max padden compactor. Now a slight modification of a max padden compactor is this uh, file that you see here. This file is called as a Revo condenser, a Revo condenser which is available from Micromega. Uh, if you look at the flutes of this instrument, they are very similar to an H5. The only difference is that the direction of these flutes is completely opposite of that of an H5. So when you use an H5, all the debris and pulp tissue from the canal are coming out. Whenever you use this condenser, all the gutta percha is getting pushed inside. So of course I need to tell you how to use this condenser and what are its advantages. I love this particular device, especially when I'm on consultations and I cannot use uh, continuous wave condensation because I cannot carry my unit everywhere. I use thermomechanical compaction. Um, the condenser, which is the Revo condenser is what we'll be using. So you take a gutta percha point, which is coated with sealer. You put this Revo condenser in your contra-angle handpiece, which is attached to a micro motor. We will rotate it at a speed of about three to 5,000 RPM in a clockwise direction. This is extremely important because if you rotate it in an anti-clockwise direction, the condenser will get sucked inside the canal and there are high chances of separation. If you are careful, the condenser will never separate. Okay. So what happens is when you rotate it at such a high speed in a clockwise direction is it exerts a lot of pressure on your gutta percha. There is a lot of friction between this condenser and the gutta percha. Because of the friction, the gutta percha gets plasticized. Because of the plasticity, the gutta percha gets pushed into the lateral anatomy. Now you just need to use accessory gutta percha points and you can complete your obturation. This is a very easy means and the most cost effective method of doing three dimensional obturation. So now I will be attending to a few case scenarios, uh, particularly two. One is going to be the management of uh, open appices. How do you obturate these cases? And the second is the obturation of uh, C-shaped root canals. So talking of management of open appices or blunderbuss canals, there are basically three methods of uh, managing it. First one is basically outdated now where we used to use uh, repeated dressings of calcium hydroxide to bring about apexification. Every three months we used to change the dressing and uh, we used to hope that uh, a pical barrier will be formed. But uh, the success was limited and the amount of time taken was very high. Uh, plus there were a lot of cases where fractures were happening because of the use of calcium hydroxide for such a long time. So then we started using uh, something called as tailor made gutta percha, uh, which looks something like this. Uh, if the patient cannot afford the use of mineral trioxide aggregate, you can make a thick GP point, uh, put it inside the canal and seal it off. The, there are, however, several risks involved with this. Um, this GP point cannot snugly fit all the areas of the root canal. Like if you can see in the apical third, I can see some dead space around the apical portion of the gutta percha point. Now, this dead space could mean failure of the case eventually. 
so i do not prefer to use this the most preferred method for uh, management of open apis is for me is the use of mta when you talk of mta uh, mta or mineral trioxide aggregate is an extremely biocompatible cement which uh, can be used for many 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 different kinds of procedures today we are only talking of obturation of open apices although mineral trioxide aggregate can also be used for regular root canal obturations there are several brands available like you can see in this picture um, the means for using mta in the canal is extremely simple uh, once your root canal has been uh, prepared and cleaned thoroughly completely what you do is you will take an mta carrier introduce the carrier inside the root canal um, i just want to tell you here that the mta carrier that i use most frequently for anterior teeth is nothing but a lumbar puncture needle or a spinal anesthesia needle that you can get at any pharmacy the only thing you need to do is you need to cut the spinal anesthesia needle to a shorter length and uh, you load the spinal anesthesia needle with mta uh, it's very similar to the use of an uh, amalgam carrier it's exactly the same thing for you you will load it with uh, mta you will dispense the mta inside the canal now for taking this mta to the apical third it is preferable that you don't use a metallic instrument you should uh, preferably use a paper point or a gutta percha point because our intention is not to condense the mta it is just to place the mta and tap it into place the difference is when you condense this mta it becomes a thick mass but the moisture of the mta is lost because this moisture is lost setting of the mta is disturbed mineral trioxide aggregate basically sets because of moisture now if the moisture is lost the setting is not predictable so always what we'll be using is we'll use a gutta percha point to carry the mta to the apical third and then to tap it into place once the apical third is obturated you may need to introduce some more uh, mineral trioxide aggregate inside the canal exactly in the same way that we did for the first uh, uh, increment once these two increments are done the apical obturation is complete so apical barrier is formed and this works well even if you have a wide open apex once this is done you only need to use your backfill gun for filling the rest of the canal but there should be a time difference of 24 hours between these two procedures because mta will take approximately 8 to 12 hours to set so it's preferable that you put a moist cotton pellet inside the canal give a temporary restoration on top and send the patient home so in practice this is how the lumbar puncture or the spinal anesthesia needle will look we'll introduce it inside the pulp chamber inside the root canal then we'll use a gutta percha for tapping the mineral trioxide aggregate inside this is one case uh, which was done with mta where i had filled uh, this lateral incisor with uh, mta but the canine and the central incisor were plain gutta percha you can see the amount of healing we have achieved in 6 months uh, another case where i had done apexification with mta uh, i have a 7 year follow up for this and uh, looks like we have achieved complete healing of the periapical lesion although this tooth uh, we had our own doubts whether uh, the tooth will last for a very long time or not one more case where there was a wide uh, large periapical lesion associated with the maxillary central and lateral incisors uh, we have uh, placed mta in the central incisor whereas the lateral incisor is just plain gutta percha obturation again and uh, you can see the amount of healing that we have achieved in only 3 months of time so what i want to tell you is that mineral trioxide aggregate works uh, fantastic when you want to do uh, apexification uh, dr roxen if you are with me on this uh, line can you please put up this poll my next question to all of you is uh, if you have a particular tooth well, like can can you leave a endodontically treated tooth without an obturation you know this is what i started my presentation with can a tooth be left without an obturation after endo treatment has has been performed i'll just exit the presentation for a little while and i'll see your answers i want to see how many of you all say yes how many of you all say no we will stop sharing the screen and 93% say that we cannot leave these teeth without uh, obturating okay 90% there are still about uh, 10% 12% people who are saying that we can leave 
uh, a truth without an obturation. Very good. I just access these results. Uh, just going through your uh, messages. Lot of highs, good mornings. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, very good morning to all of you. I have a lot of my seniors with me here. I have a few friends from outside India here. Thank you very much for being around. I have very senior endodontists here, uh, which is really a pleasure for me. And uh, there are some few questions which I will want to uh, address to at the end. I am still waiting for a few more answers from you. Yeah, so coming back to the polls, um, the results I have right now is approximately 16% people say that you can leave a tooth without obturation after performing endodontic treatment, uh, whereas close to 83-84% are saying that you cannot leave it uh, without an obturation. So let's see what exactly I am talking about when I am asking this question to you. Um, let's go to this beautiful procedure called pulp vascularization. Um, although this may, this may sound like something straight outside of a science fiction movie, uh, pulp revascularization is not really that new. Uh, people have been trying it, it has been under research since many, many, many years and I can confidently tell you that this is a procedure that you can practically perform inside your clinic right now. The only catch here is that the case selection is extremely critical. What happens in pulp revascularization is, Let's say you have a patient with a wide open apex. This is an immature tooth. The apex is completely open. The apical area of the tooth has stem cells. These stem cells are called stem cells of apical papilla or SCAP, S-C-A-P. When you have these stem cells of apical papilla, what you do is these stem cells of apical papilla are extremely potent and they can um, differentiate into odontogenic cells. What I mean by this is these odontogenic cells inside the root canals can lead to continuation of the formation of the root in two terms. First, it can increase the length of the root. Second, it can also add uh, diameter to the dentine. So basically the root canal diameter decreases. How do you achieve this? Uh, let's see this in short. I want to first discuss us about the case selection because case selection is the most important point. Uh, people who want, you all can take a picture of this slide, you all can take a snapshot of this slide. Uh, when you talk of case selection, the most important point in case selection is you need to have a, a patient who is young age. You cannot have a patient who has gone, I am sorry, just one moment, I have uh, I just got a message that I've forgotten to share my screen. So yeah, I'll just go back to you. I'm extremely sorry about this. Um, yeah, I hope I'm with you now. So we will just repeat the last couple of slides that we discussed. I forgot to share the screen. So yeah, coming to uh, revascularization of the pulp. Now, uh, this technique, like I told you, has been uh, in use since a very long time. What I mean by pulp revascularization is this procedure. This is a tooth which has a wide open apex. There are stem cells which are present in the apical area. These brown tissue that you see here are the stem cells. These stem cells have the potential to differentiate into odontogenic cells, that is tooth forming cells. These are called as stem cells of the apical papilla. After the procedure that we perform, which is called the revascularization procedure, what happens is these stem cells enter inside the canal and because of the odontogenic nature, they can bring about increase in length of the root. Once the length of the root is increased, they can also bring about increase in the thickness of the radicular dentine. So the diameter of the root canal reduces. Uh, this has several advantages because the length is increasing, the strength of the tooth or the retention of the tooth inside the bone is also going to improve. And because of uh, in a decrease in the diameter of the root canal, and increase in the diameter of the radicular dentine, the tooth tends to become stronger. So it can uh, accept more forces. So let's come to the selection of the case. What exactly is required when we uh, talk about pulp revascularization? The primary requirement is that your patient must be young. 
what i mean by this is a patient who has already crossed the age of 14 or 15 you should not be attempting this procedure so the ideal case is a young boy who is say about 10 12 years of age who had suffered trauma 3 4 years back when he was 7 year old or 8 year old uh, because of the trauma the tooth has never been able to form completely and uh, now the patient is coming to you so you must think about performing pulp revascularization another ideal case uh, as per me is a young mandibular or maxillary molar for a patient who is about 9 or 10 year old uh, with a huge cavity in that particular molar you often see that the uh, apex is wide open uh, these cases also are ideal for uh, performing pulp revascularization you need to be sure that the tooth has sufficient structure left and you don't need to put a post and core because if you remember the procedure uh, you don't have any space to put a post because there is an mta seal that we are going to put here your patient must be uh, very cooperative and should be ready to come to you for routine follow ups because follow ups are extremely important um you must not you must be sure that the apex is wide open slightly wide apex is not okay we need an apex which is more than 100 number 5 in diameter so it's a really wide apex you should inform the patient that you will need to come multiple times so he should be ready for that and you should also accept to him all the alternative treatments that you have uh, any doubts about this procedure uh, i'll put up my phone number at the end please feel free to uh, whatsapp me i'll try to send you whatever is possible from my end now Uh, how do you perform this procedure extremely simple let me tell you this procedure is 100 times simpler compared to a regular root canal that you are doing and it is it gives you um, predictable results so let's look at this uh, let's see the first appointment you give anesthesia to the patient you perform rubber dam isolation you perform access opening do not introduce any instruments inside the root canal perform copious gentle irrigation with sodium hypochlorite followed by saline dry your canals with paper points make a mix of triple antibiotic paste place it inside the root canal as a dressing seal the canal with a temporary restoration and then put glass isomer cement on top why why glass isomer cement because we are going to leave it for 3 weeks um one question that i think that you all may have in your mind is what exactly is this, this triple antibiotic paste so triple antibiotic paste is a mix of um metronidazole minocycline and uh, ciprofloxacin these three antibiotics combined together are known as triple antibiotic paste uh, it becomes a powder you have to uh, mix this powder with saline or chlorhexidine or with uh, propylene glycol and you introduce it inside the canal once this is done you dismiss the patient for the next 3 weeks let's see what you do after 3 weeks when the patient reports back to you after 3 weeks you will check the signs and symptoms that the patient has most cases your patient will feel completely comfortable the swelling or pain would have completely gone away i want you to notice that in the first appointment we have not done any instrumentation at all we have not used a single file we have only irrigated the canals thoroughly and we have placed a dressing in the canal in the second appointment if we realize that the patient is completely asymptomatic we will use anesthesia without a vasoconstrictor why without a vasoconstrictor because this appointment we want to induce some bleeding inside the root canal if you use a vasoconstrictor the bleeding will not be there and your canal will not be filled with blood see the entire idea is i'm just going back to the previous slide when you have this particular picture th these stem cells of apical papilla i put a file from here once and i disturb the stem cells of apical papilla these stem cells will come inside the canal along with the blood right this blood will get clot like this now this clot will have some stem cells suspended in the entire uh, matrix or uh, in the entire scaffold because of this it is these stem cells that are going to bring about formation of the dentine so i am not going to use any vasoconstrictor here i will take a single file take it beyond the apex and uh, i will bring about bleeding or i will basically stimulate bleeding from the periapical tissues i will take a small cotton pellet to arrest the bleeding about 2 to 3 mm apical to the cesion once the bleeding has arrested and a clot has formed inside the root canal i will mix mineral trioxide aggregate 
which is MDA, and I will uh, place it. Sorry, I will place it like this as a coronal barrier. After this, I will place some glass ionomer cement and a permanent composite restoration. Did you get the procedure here for this MTA? I do not need to plate, uh, place a moist cotton pellet because this bleeding will have moisture. The moisture will help the MTA to set. Here we have written GIC or MTA because that was what was given in the guidelines in 2013. But MTA is the material of choice for this procedure. Is this procedure successful? It is extremely successful. When you take a patient on follow up, you will see that the patient does not have any pain, any soft tissue swelling. As you keep taking the patient on follow ups in a few months, you will see that the periapical radial lucency has also completely disappeared and that the length and the width of the root are increasing. So the tooth is becoming as close to normal as possible. The only thing is you should always inform your patient in a few months or in a few years if we realize that we need to perform endodontic treatment for this tooth we will be doing a regular root canal treatment that's all that may be needed it will be very easy to perform it because this might be the scenario after a couple of years maybe the patient will report to you with pain you need to drill through the composite through the glass ionomer cement you need to drill out the mta coronal barrier that you had put and you will find a canal which will have some tissue which will be similar to pulp. Now, when we talk of obturations, uh, we also need to talk about uh, sealer puffs because uh, these sealer puffs are something that have become extremely popular, especially because of uh, social media. Um, what we see in these sealer puffs is that there is a lot of sealer that comes out of the canal. You see tiny balls around the canal, uh, around the apical third of the root. These sealer puffs are generally present in the periapical area. What happens because of these sealer puffs is now you may have a question. Should I try to achieve a sealer puff? My answer to that would be no. However, there are some endodontists who feel that a sealer puff is the only way to be sure that your working length estimation was correct. What I feel is if you have used your apex locator correctly, you can always be sure of the working length. Why do I say that you should not try to achieve a sealer puff? Because whenever you get a puff of sealer in the apical third of the root, what happens is this causes some amount of pain to the patient. There is also local necrosis that occurs in this periapical area. So the next two to three days or maybe up to five days, the patient will feel some pain. And sometimes uh, you may perform overzealous pumping of the sealer, which may give you results which may be similar to this. There have been numerous case reports where sealer has entered into the trabecular pattern of the bone or sometimes sealer has entered the mandibular canal. It has brought about paresthesia of the mandibular nerve. So what I'll advise is don't try to get a sealer puff. If it comes well and good, if not, please don't put in any extra effort to intentionally get a puff of sealer. Let's see another type of case uh, that is a C-shaped canal. Now uh, these cases have a very complex anatomy. The canal is basically in the form of a C. This is what it looks like to you when you do an axis opening. So I'll explain to you uh, with the case. This is a mandibular second molar uh, that I was treating. Now, uh, when I saw the radiograph, I was almost certain that this will be a C-shaped canal. How? Uh, C-shaped canals are most common in mandibular second molars. Secondly, the mesial and the distal roots seem to fuse with each other. Third point is I have one large distal canal, but my mesial canal seems to disappear in the coronal or the middle. Canal. Then we perform an axis opening and we realize that this is a true C-shaped canal. The mesiobuccal canal, which is this here, and the distal canal are fusing with each other. And my mesiolingual canal is separate. Now, because of this large intercommunication between the canals, the amount of pulp tissue is also massive. Your irrigation has to be very, very thorough. Your uh, shaping has to be circumferential inside the canal. This is a working length radiograph that I took. This is my master cone radiograph. This is my final obturation. Now, if I were to perform this obturation using lateral compaction, I would have never got a good seal. I would have always left some dead space inside the canal, which is why what I used here was continuous wave condensation. And this is the final obturation. So please remember thermoplastic obturations are absolutely mandatory whenever you have a 
C-shaped kana. Now the thing to see here is that this single GP that you see here is my mesolingual canal. This thick gutta percha here, the thick obturation in the distal that you see is actually the mesiobuccal and the distal canal which are intercommunicating with each other. Uh, please always have tremendous faith in the root canals that you're performing because endo can give you a kind of healing that you can never even expect out of it. Just routine non-surgical endodontics with a good three-dimensional cleaning and shaping and then a three-dimensional fill. Always remember if your irrigant has not reached a particular portion of the root canal, your obturating materials can never reach that part of the root canal. So give maximum importance to uh, three-dimensional cleaning and shaping and then to your 3D obturation. We are open to questions now. I want to uh, thank uh, the Group Pharmaceuticals company and uh, the Dental Reach. Group Pharmaceuticals have basically uh, initiated this entire process and Dental Reach has brought about entire coordination for this fantastic webinar. Thanks a lot all of you. It was great interacting with all of you here and uh, many thanks to Group Pharmaceuticals for uh, doing the entire session here. Thanks a lot.